Well, hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of Grow Weed at Home, Gua, with Kyle <laughs> Cushman. And as you can see, I have a really special guest here with me today. His name is Leo Stone. Uh, he is the uh, originator, the creator, the founder of uh, Aficionado Seeds and the French Connection, and um, and also a personal friend of mine. And I want to thank yeah, you. Yeah, we go back for coming out here. Thank you, thank you for having me. So this is truly um, this is a really Im important show for me. Like they're all important and they're all fun. Um, I thought about this for a long time. And hopefully, I, I, I got some notes down here, you know, but hopefully I bring it all together. And, um, you know, we have a lot of roots together. I mean, I started my California journey in Mendo. Yeah, yep. You know, and, you know, we ended up uh, not necessarily like traveling in the same circle, but certainly knowing and associating with a lot of the same people. 100%. And, uh, you know... I think I want to start off with asking you, because it's a really uh, it's a really dear feeling to me. What does Mendo? What does Mendocino mean to you? Man, you start off with a hard one. It's. Um, I mean, for me, it's okay. It's a conversation. You don't have to get it all out. I, I guess, once. like a lot of people, it's like Mendo's Mendo's subject, subjective. But I think for anyone that's that's been there especially people like me or you who weren't born there. We were kind of like transplanted there. Like our passions kind of took us there because that's where the culture was most acceptable. So like for anybody, it's magic. You know, yeah. I think that's like the common consensus is when people go up to Humble, I mean, go up to Humble or Mendo, it's like, it's magic. It's enchanting. Like there's a vibe there. Like when you, whenever you go to, you know, a magical place like Hawaii, you know, like that's like the, the closest thing I could equate it to. And it's unique. When you step off Plano Hawaii, the fucking island is breathing. It's alive. And there's a really similar vibe in Mendo where there's like a very strong, profound, magical feeling, but also intertwined with a lot of darkness. And I think that's what attracted me too, is because at one point, when you really think about it, you know, Mendo and Humboldt, when we were at, at the time, back in the day when they were producing 80, 75 to 80 percent of the whole of, of, of all the weed in the nation, it was the world's largest homogenous group of career outlaws, career criminals. And that was to me, that was beautiful that you had a community of career outlaws who are willing to sacrifice their freedom, their well-being, their safety so they could pursue a craft they were really passionate about. And that's what I really fell in love with. And granted, you know, you have partitions in the grow community in Mendo and Humboldt where, you know, people are up there just to make money. And but you also have this huge community of like all these families bound together by doing the thing, by the hustle. And they all look out for each other when the cops are coming up the road. Everybody calls each other. Hey, get your shit and get the fuck out. Like that was beautiful to me. You know, yeah. so, um, you know, now, unfortunately, a lot of that magic is is kind of a thing of the past. Everything but changes. It's still magic. Yeah. And everybody who still goes up to Mendo and Humboldt, they're just in awe of of the sheer beauty and, and, and majesty that, that's like the mountains, the trees, the water cleanliness. And, you know, maybe we'll get into it later, but it's it's so incredibly unique for growing exquisite cannabis because you have this arid temperate environment. It doesn't rain during the summer. You have in the the proximity you have in a lot of places in Humboldt and Mendocino, you have like this indirect marine influence. So the bud gets, you know, you have these high elevations, cold temperatures at night, but you also have this marine influence that brings a lot of minerals and salts in the air that allows the bud to express itself like anything I've ever seen. I believed that when I was there, but then when I left Mendo to go do projects all around the country and grow up and down the state of California, it's like, that's still the benchmark. If you want to grow the best possible sun-grown cannabis in my opinion it's like without a doubt unequivocally categorically it is fucking mendocino and humble so in it, trinity it, 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 it is it just it, and that's why before anybody even uh would describe it to a camera or a microphone yeah. the emerald triangle was known pretty much around the world as a spot they know just like the bermuda triangle was a place that, that the world knew about yeah. the emerald triangle was also a place that the pe know. people knew yeah. about and just know? like you where are you from yeah. where are you living humble oh oh they, they they're not yeah. even being to be but right. they've heard if they heard that name mendo or humble they know you know like okay i see what he's up to yeah. so you know so you get a sense of uh 
how lucky I feel to have just been transported there. You know, I got asked by High Times to do a story on Eddie Lepp. So lucky. And the next thing you know, I'm driving by Lake Mendocino going, what the fuck am I doing living in New York? (laughs) And uh, This exists? What's going on? And then, you know, we start hanging out with, you know, Shiloh Massive. And and I'm hanging out with Jack Herrer. I'm wearing my Jack Herrer Foundation shirt today. And I'm hanging out with Eddie Lepp. And I'm hanging out with real legends, uh, real legends, um, True legends. Dennis Perone, the and just on and on <laughs> and on and on. And so, yeah, I carry that. I carry that torch, you know, uh, uh, just uh, I feel like a lucky person to be able to talk about it from experience, not just like as an interviewer or, a, you know, I, I it, it was an amazing experience. I think you have that same experience, right, where a lot of people that I've seen come up to Mendo once and they just never leave right you know they're like I'm staying right. and that's what happened to me I, I went up to kind of scout some things out and I just ended up staying and I was going to do whatever it took to stay in Mendo you know that was like a lot of sacrifice when you're not from there we got lucky you know if you're not from there the bar to entry and the difficult the, 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 how oh. difficult it is Oh, you know, to just become a part of the community there is like one of the hardest things I've ever accomplished. I, I, I got again, I got double lucky because not only did I get invited there, basically, like like I had Eddie and the Dukes and all those people who were like, look, you know, we know you're a high times journalist and a lot of people don't like high times journalists, but we know you're cool and we're going to let you be OK. But what is really see, I say this a lot. I moved to California to Mendo to not be a criminal for the first time in my life. So remember when you were at my house and I <laughs> yeah, was like, you know, you know, I got some rebel balls too, but not like you guys, you know? And, and so here, I'll pass this to you. So what I really didn't realize until just recently is I was really lucky because I was kind of naive. I was very naive when I was there. And just because I said I didn't want to be a criminal, I still was, I was still running with the same pack and I was still taking yeah. the same chances as everybody else, but I thought it wasn't. You get yeah, it? Yeah. I thought I was above it somehow. I'm doing the journalistic thing and I'm keeping my numbers low and blah, blah, blah. And then I get busted. <laughs> I got busted in Willits, you know, and it, it all worked out. 18 months of non-reporting probation, blah, blah, blah. Good old Brook Trails. Ringer. Shout yeah, out Brook Trails. J- j- Brook Trails. Just like everybody <laughs> else. So, so, so Mendocino, man. So now... You're in Mendocino, and um, you're loving it. I mean, you're just loving it. You're in your element totally. You don't feel out of your element at all. Like me. I, I, like, you're there. I always felt like an outsider when I was there. I always felt like... But you were in your that element. That was where I wanted to be. Yeah. Like, that's where, like, I wanted to live and die there, and that's, that, it was it That for came me. quick I, for I me, I wanted too. to just stay, live on the mountain forever, grow weed, and just do my own thing, breed my plants, grow the best possible weed that I could ever so, grow. So... So tell me about, tell us, tell everybody about when, um, you just kind of, uh, glanced on it. When, tell me about the moment when you remember, when you decided that that is what you wanted to be remembered for or to make a legacy or that breeding, that leaving great strains, that's what you wanted to do. When, when, how many years in, well, where were you? What kind of situation were you? Were you growing indoors? You were, I knew you I wanted... a big farm? Was it all easy then? What was going on? The reason Mendo was really special to me is I wanted to come to Mendo before I was, I was really growing weed. You know, when I was still in... Before I was growing weed full time. You know, when I was still in Germany... You wanted to or you did? I wanted oh, oh, to. Oh, you're saying... Yeah, yeah. So, I got, you're, so you're we got vision. stopped. When I was in the army, we got stopped coming back from Amsterdam with... And we got caught with hash and seeds... And um, in the, you're still oh, I'm still in the army at this time. Ooh, that's rough. And I remember getting back to the barracks and, you know, we're in trouble. We're waiting for the MPs to come pick us up. They're like, hey, get to your barracks rooms. Don't go nowhere. Um, Article I 15 remember, in the very least. Bro, <laughs> I remember watching TV. We got that in common, too. Watching TV and seeing Mendocino on TV about the big house grows and the big grows that were going on there. And everyone's freaking out that was in the car with me. They're like, oh, our, our careers are over. Our lives are over. And at this time, you know, at this point, we were going back and forth to Amsterdam a lot. We were, you know, producing parties in Germany, you know. Um, and so when you're a part of that community and you're throwing parties, you know, I just wanted to get paid to party when I was in Germany. So I was like throwing parties in Germany. And then some dude comes up to me 
at the beginning of the night, the beginning of the event, he's like, hey, I'm going to move some stuff around on the dance floor, if you don't mind, but I'll give you a cut at the end. And I really didn't know what he's talking about at the time. I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds cool. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to get paid from the bar and all the, uh, you know, all the entry fees coming into the party. And uh, we're wrapping the party up, like, around 4 a.m. because the clubs stay closed, open really long in Germany. And this dude comes up to me at the end of the night and hands me this fucking fat stack. He's like, here's your cut for the night. When's your next party? And I went, what the fuck? Really? And so we, me and him became, like, really good friends. My best friend ended up dating his sister. <laughs> and I remember coming out to, you know, Chris's car one time and his girlfriend, you know, we call her Angelina. She looked like a Moroccan Angelina Jolie. And she opens her hood and nothing in the whole fucking field of the, the whole where you put the spare tire was just bricks of hash. And that was the coolest thing I ever heard in my life. And they were like, hey, we're going to go get more bricks of hash. You want to come? And I'm like, yeah, let's go. And we ended up going to Strasbourg, France, which is like right over the border uh-huh. in Germany and France. And that's where we were buying hash for a long time, which, you know, eventually we'll get to it. But that's why, why I connect with Frenchie so hard is because like my first entrance into the weed game wasn't growing weed. It was smoking hash, selling hash, moving hash around mm. Europe. And then we th- I thought it was cool that different hashes would give you a different high mm-hmm. and then i'd go to a coffee shop in amsterdam i'm like wait 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 i could bring seeds of it i could buy a seed and and keep it and grow it like later and have this hash later or something better I'm like this is amazing you know it's like <laughs> so it's like that kind of lifestyle where you go from like consumer to i think i'm going to start growing right. and then you know we ended up become because we were throwing parties i made really good friends with a guy named stefan who is not his real name, but he was a graduate student at the University University de Mainz, and he was a biochemistry major. And he grew the strongest weed that, when we were smoking hash all the time, he pulls out this super lemon haze. And like I, I think I was pretty drunk at the time too, but I remember smoking this joint and going in the bathroom and just puking my guts out. And oh I'm really, like, bro? What did you lace the weed with? And he's like, "No, it's it's organic. It's good. It's biologic." And you know, he's like, "It's it's." It, and the, it, th- that was my first entry into anyone growing, right? Was someone who is growing organic, and so like that's like the most lucky I've gotten, because it wasn't someone growing hydro or salts. It was like that was the fucking baseline for me. Mm. The strongest weed I ever smoked. It was organic, and I was willing to learn whatever I could from him. And so that was like really kind of my foundation in the very beginning right and then it just so happens that when we got busted you know I, I knew I was gonna get you know I was I was being forced to leave the army I still got an honorable discharge because I did a lot of stuff and I, I was spent 16 months in Iraq and they didn't overlook that and they knew that we were just kind of self-medicating because we came back from Iraq and we were drinking heavy conditional discharge heavy yeah oh it was a it was it was but an I, honorable discharge right. but on my 215 it says you know drug rehabilitation failure because I kept popping hot for weed it was like you guys are going to condone me drinking a bottle of vodka every day to kind of self-medicate the shit I saw in the desert but you know oh god forbid if I get high off the natural plant, herb, you know right, what I mean exactly. so that's why we Good really turned to weed like yeah. yeah we wanted to get paid to party because we were drinking a lot but then we started self-medicating on weed hardcore more than alcohol and a lot of us who were doing a bottle of vodka a day we start we stopped drinking just so we could smoke more and become like have a cleaner head we felt like we were able to kind of address our traumas without just being medicated when you're in that kind of sedated haze so so you decided long before you came to Mendo long that, that you were going to breed weed and then, yeah. Oh, after you decided no, you no, could do this for yourself. No, no, no. Could, that's I what I... So that's when, incorrect. When, I, no, when did I knew when? I was... I wanted to go to Mendo. I didn't discover breeding until OG Mike took me under his wing. And that was... Was that the same Med Mike that I know? When everything changed. From oh, Lake County? Mendo Mike... No, Mike... Mendo Mike worked with Eddie Lepp. Right. And so when I met Mendo Mike, I was the head of his security. I was fresh out of the army. Mm-hmm. Um, I had I had my, um, my arms permit for a security guard. And he was like, hey, I need you to head security at the club. And have my back. My brother got me that job because he went to go work somewhere else and make a lot more money. He was like, hey, I'm working for this dude from Mendo. That's about when I first came to Cali. Yeah, I'm working for this dude from Mendo. What do you, you know, do you want this job? And that that dude was the one who ended up being like this insanely good organic grower, ran a club. But but the reason why I brought him up when you said Lake County is he opened that club in San Diego with Eddie Lepp back in the day. Right. Yeah. So like, that's what's crazy. Like you knew Eddie Lepp and Jack. 
my OG, who's like M Mendo Mike, is like the guy who's like, he's like my weed father, my OG. I wouldn't be here without my, you know, OG Mike and my brother. Like, they're the ones who really got me in. All the shit moving hash and everything. That was like, and he, a lot of people are doing that around the world. Mm -hmm. But working in the industry, coming to a place like Mendo, and, you know, you have to know somebody. So it was like, right. if right, it wasn't exactly. for Eddie Lepp, right, who right. you worked with that right. opened that fucking club with o OG Mike, right. I never would have met OG Mike and had the opportunity to go up the north and we went up north because the sheriff shut us oh, down i'd have been assassinated <laughs> if i didn't have eddie lepp in my corner I'd, I'd have been assassinated a long time ago i don't think a lot along, of people along with Les crane and appreciate how how insanely influential eddie lepp was on the early culture you know like the dude he got locked up for going two football fields of weed off the highway 20 this was like in mid 2000s I have a lot of emotions inside yeah. about Eddie because I loved Eddie. I called Eddie Papa and he called me son. And uh, when I moved to California, I didn't have a place to live. I moved out here with my 13-year-old cat. No way, really? And I was supposed to move into the farm. I was going to move into the bunkhouse yeah. on his lake. And it was only the last day on my way driving here that a friend of mine, Billy Blackburn, who created the uh, Easy Clone, had a friend up in uh, oh, cool. Laytonville who had just built a house and moved out of his trail, gave me his trailer, and I ended up moving up there. But... You know, I just, uh, so after this statement, I do want to ask, uh, so it's like, I just, I, I saw the whole thing unfold before it happened about Eddie going to jail and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And I was like, I was watching a, was like watching a slow motion car accident. And I, I just didn't want it to go that way. I wanted 100%. him to, instead of growing 10,000 plants and having 2,000 notes, why couldn't he have just had 200 notes and grown 2,000 plants and it would have been the largest cash crop, legal cash crop in America. He would have been on 60 minutes. You know, that's, you know, but wada, yada, yada, yada. But, so, tell, tell me in some of the ways that Eddie was an influence early on in, in, in that part of California, you know, cause I know, I think the best way I'll try to explain that is kind of reasoning the current state of the market right now in the trends in genetics. Right. So if you look at strains like Mendo breath, right. Gave birth to peanut butter breath and all these breaths, right. Motor like breath. The, the common denominator with the breath, right? What made the breath amazing was the cherry pie kush. Uh, that cherry pie kush. That was Eddie's. Yeah, it was. Well, it's it's contested whether Eddie made it or someone on Eddie's farm made it or right. this guy named St. George right. and Willits made it. But Eddie, Eddie held, probably didn't make Eddie it. Held he seeds, pro Eddie probably didn't make right? it. Eddie held the right. seeds for the cherry pie sure. kush. When he got locked up, he gifted those seeds to this guy named Alan Atkinson, who I worked with in the past and he owns a company called Grokashi. He's one of the first people to really sure. mix, you know, doing kind of um, aerobic fermentations and anaerobic fermentations mm -hmm. and, and implementing it with organic cannabis. Mm -hmm. But he was a good friend of Eddie Lepp's. So when Eddie went to prison, he gave Alan this box of seeds that had the cherry pie kush seeds. And I remember seeing this box and him telling me like how valuable this box is. Eventually Alan went to work with these guys, Gage Green, and ended up giving them the cherry pie kush and then cherry pie kush ended up being one of the most influential strains you know in cannabis as far as like its source code and, did and, spliffy and, use that and, on and a lot of a lot of stuff spliffy mr spliff that, that was gauge green before it was gauge green oh no way with key play yeah it was they got it when fang was with when fang was with key play when they were gauge green mm. so it was when the asian guy fang um, he was with because they were working with Alan when they were living in Willits him and Keyplay were living in Willits and They were working with Alan. This was like a few years after I stopped working with Alan because I wanted to kind of I sidetracked my you. own thing I sidetracked you. Yeah, but that's like what if you explain Eddie Lepp and his influence It's like you could you kind of say his influence is just him having that box of seed and giving it to the right people It's like it's kind of changed the landscape of cannabis genetics like back in the day when cherry pie kush was hot in the market you didn't see a lot of like gassy and sweet strains at the same time that was one of the first it was like gassy and sweet and, and crazy fucking frosty like when we were working at the club down in la it's like every time we had packs of cherry pie kush come through the club like that shit was gone and so there's a lot of 
bullshit cherry pie crisp rolling around, but the one that Eddie Lap Allen had, the original Gage Green guys, and and St. George down in um down in Willits. Shout out St. George. Uh, like Eddie Lep also carried those. But and then you look on like a political and medical sense where Eddie Lep was really good friends with Dennis Perone and Dennis Perone was responsible, was was partially responsible for helping get two fifteen passed in the mid nineties. Right. It's like Eddie was behind the scenes and and all that. Like when Eddie Lep was in Lake County, he had people like you working with him and, and Shiloh Massive and it's like like OG Mike, Mugolin. OG Mike really influenced me to breed because he was the first dude that was making seeds, shouldn't be making seeds. But it was when I started fucking around with Shiloh through at, through Alan Atkinson, where I was really, I was, I was. Uh, that's when I became really inspired to really take my breeding up to the next level. So, you know, if it wasn't for Eddie Lepp, uh, I think Eddie Lepp binds all those elements together. And then you have like Eddie Lepp's relationship with Third Gen. Third Gen is the most winningest cannabis company to come out of fucking california period dot period with the exception of dna oh man i love them guys yeah aaron and don aaron lives pretty much kind of just up the road from me a little ways and it was really funny a couple years back i'm pretty sure it might have even been pre-pandemic it's hard everything melds together Mm -hmm. I just shot on the highway on the 101 with my Jaguar with the, in my convertible, and I'm just kind of like hitting the gas to like get on. And then there's this Lamborghini comes next to me, and I kind of glance over, and there's Aaron right there. He recognized me. We kind of we kind of said what up to each other. He took off, and we just kind of like raced in and out for a mile or so. That's and then, fucking awesome. You know, it was <laughs> just perfect timing. Yeah, good guy. Having a, I haven't seen him in a little while. They. I mean, they were the first big, like, huge breeders in the game, like, from, from the U.S. You know, like, you know, you had, like, like we were talking earlier, you know, like, yeah, you had Soma uh-huh. and you had TH Seeds, but when you looked at, like, profound, like, influence and, like, you know, their their impact on the market and the, the culture. The original like, expats. Bro, yeah. Expatriate. They had to expatriate out of their own country so that they could, uh, uh, you know, do their thing. And uh, I don't know. I think they, they changed li- the game. I think they lived out of country for 20 plus years. Yeah, they were real pioneers. Like, yeah, there's the dudes, you know, like, I don't know if they like me much, but I don't really know them. And you're like, why, why do you say that? Why would you choose those words? And I was like, I, it was at the Cannabis Cup in L.A. in like 2013. It was our first Cannabis Cup. And we're setting up our booth. And back in the day, our booth looked totally different than everybody's. We had like glass jewelry cases, leather couches and shit in the back. Made it look like... The, the antithesis of like the kind of the stoner setup and so don and aaron come up to the booth and i'm like you're nudging my partners I'm like bro that's fucking don and fucking aaron you know they're like the big dogs at this point and i'm like what's up man i'm like big fans of your work and i don't know if i said that but i just remember aaron going why are your seeds so expensive <laughs> and because this is at a time in the market when like you know we came out everybody fish- thought that but he had the nerve to come we and had ask two you. price points 250 and 500 bro and he was like why are they so expensive is it because these fancy boxes because back in the day we had the wooden right. boxes now we right. just have wooden boxes for french right. connection and um i told him I was like look i've been working out of china for a long time and these, let me tell you these boxes are really cheap like they're, they're expensive because we represent you know mendo right now in the emerald triangle and so this is for us to showcase the potential of the emerald triangles like we didn't need the seed company money it's like we were we were growing so we made all our money growing and the seed company was kind of like, let's grow this thing slow and put a bu- and, 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 you know, put, put a bunch of money into it and just try to create the best possible genetics because, you know, we're living just fine off of growing. We don't need to rely on this. So that's why we were able to have kind of that approach and then risk, you know, almost not selling boxes, but, you know, to the grace of gods and, you know, thankful to all the good energies on the world. It's like we've sold out every year since then. So it was just like, and, you know, he asked me, he's like, why are they $500? Like, Aaron was like, why $500? Like, bro, I'm paying $50 a seed to these OGs up north. That's like, When I wanted OG seeds, that shit was $50 a fucking seed. Right. And I'll say shout out, shout out Seed 707. They're, they're a small account on IG, but real big influencers in Mendo culture back in the day. There's Mama Mary and Joe. Shout out Mama Mary and Joe. 
because Joe made me fucking pay fifty dollars for OG seeds back in the day, and that and, made you give back. And, the kids and he back couldn't to your have people. enough. Like everybody yeah. was throwing money at it, yeah. you know. And it's just like what we said, like uh, you know, when people were paying ten thousand for a clone, yeah. you know, when when the price was forty two, yeah. or in the thirty eights, it was like dog like the roi on that's like two pounds and some change you know what i mean <laughs> <clears throat> so you know it, it kind of made sense back in the day but yeah shout out don and aaron at grilling me about my seeds because they've always been big influences yeah i'm ricky williams and i'm known for being a professional football player heisman trophy winner 1998 pro bowl 2002 specifically known for being that football player who quit to smoke weed There's such a stigma that cannabis is this negative thing. But when you have the experience of taking a seed and putting it into soil and watching it grow, and it's a beautiful plant, especially as it starts to flower. I think it helps remove any kind of mental blocks or, or negative ideas about what cannabis is when you, when you have that experience of growing it yourself. I just want to give props to Brandon yeah. because I've I've watched Big him ups. I've watched him mature over the years, and I'm glad he ain't quite so feisty. He, a, he ain't quite yeah. so feisty as he, he yeah used yeah he's feisty. So you stay but feisty, no one, but no one but, works harder than Brandon. That's so good. Shout out Brandon. That's good because he's always we always we kind of had a rivalry in the past, me and third gen, but he was always like a good rivalry because when I was like when we were hanging out, I I never met anybody that worked fucking harder than him. They had, that had that in intensity of a work ethic. And as I think the intensity in his personality where he kind of comes mm -hmm. off abrasive, I think that's kind of what fuels him on the inside to be successful at cannabis because he's still doing his own things. He's the reason I started doing shows. He's the reason I really started pushing myself on the cup circuit. This dude's got over 100 cups now. Like, we're at 48. Like, well, I'm always chasing this fucking guy. But it's like back, back again to fucking Eddie Lett. Eddie Lepp had a, such a profound influence on, on like all these huge players in cannabis that ended up contributing towards the altering and, and the shifting and the changing of the cannabis fucking well, I wouldn't be sitting here uh, if it wasn't for Eddie talking Me to neither. you. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure. And, um, you know... You know, that just brings me to... Uh, it really just... I can't not talk about Frenchie right now because... Bro. <laughs> because I just, I just feel I'm just like now okay to it, talk for, about it. I just really, I, I, I know that, I know yeah. that, and um, uh, I, I, I know that Frenchie brought us together. I, 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 yeah, know yeah. Without, I know that without, I know that without, if I hadn't have made a, a relationship with Frenchie earlier on and Kimberly, that you know, I mean, I'm not saying you would have not noticed me or been friends or anything. I'm just saying I just feel like I do feel like the the it, it, it's all a continuation of of a friendship that, you know, is, uh, is alive through memory, through our memories. And, uh, you know, I have a, I, I, I have a funny, uh, that's not funny. I, I have, a, I have a, I have a hope that, um, we create something. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mention to everybody. We've got a collaboration going on. Oh yeah. Now, we got a collab happening, you know? And, uh, I hinted about it. I put some stuff on my post. I showed the pollen and all. And, and I just, I hope we can create something that sparks something in us that makes us, that seems appropriate to honor Frenchie yeah, with a strain. You'd you be know? stoked. And yeah, you'd uh, be excited we're working together. You know, aside from the FYT and the, you know, whatever yeah. else we come up with, you know, <laughs> I hope we come, you know, something just, just the FYT is going to be great. Right. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, great. So look. As you can tell, if you didn't know, you know, if you tuned in, you know, wanting to learn more about Leo or you had respect or admiration for him, you know, you've learned more than you already knew. And if you didn't know, you can see that, you know, this gentleman's got a deep um, uh, experience in, you know, it's not just the cannabis market and not just selling seeds. It's in the culture. 100%. And so so now that we've we've exposed that and there's no doubt to be had about that, I got to ask some just like I feel like there's some things that people out there listening want to know from a professional breeder. Okay. And that is like, they may sound obvious, but like, how, what are the traits that you use to choose males and females? Well, first off, I think if you want to be a breeder, you have to really just focus on things you like, right? Like, so if you're a chef, there's a certain type of cuisine that you specialize in because mm -hmm. that's what you personally like. Or yeah, if you, you don't eat Chinese pursue. food, you're not going to cook so Chinese I think, food. 
I think right? having that f- having that frame of mind right. on like what your taste is is gonna is gonna dictate what you select for, right? Because when I select a cherry pie strain, like something from the original cut of cherry pie, is gonna be way different than how I select something that I want dominance for for sour diesel. Very so good. These are two of my my favorite strains. Okay. Right? So cherry, some of the characteristics of cherry is you have uh, shorter trichome stalks, mm-hmm. right? Um, you have smaller resin heads. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a more compact internodal spacing, and um, you also have um, you also have this kind of weird lotiony wetness to the bud. You don't have that sticky or tackiness that you got it's from like greasy. you get from like an OG or an old blackberry. Right. You, it's kind of like yeah, it's definitely greasy. It, g- it cherries generally do shit in hash. They don't really dump in the bag, right? And so those are characteristics that if I'm trying to breed a cherry pie dominant plant. I'm looking for that, right? Or versus if I'm looking for sour diesel dominancy, I'm looking for a longer internodal spacing. I'm looking for a leaf pattern, the color, the depth of the leaf. I want a dark green, leathery sheen to the leaf. Interesting. But I want a bright green you're not profile just, just on the to, Just color. to know that you're not always looking for short internodal spacing no, is, is, a, ever. is a tidbit right there. Ever. And, what do you mean ever? And, and there's sometimes... Because you don't know what a plant's going to do, right? Like, so your phenotype... Like we, we should all be saying really a chemovar, right? Because phenotype is really, you know, it, it's, it's the environmental expression of a genetic. Right. You know, so right. it's like how, you know, if, if, we, if I grew your starberry cough right mm-hmm. now, it'd come out completely different than how you grow it, right? So, but, but there's g- generally certain genetic characteristics and traits that I'll, de- I'll, I'll de- definitely zone in on. And those are traits that you'll usually find universally throughout a bunch of growers, right? So that's when, when I'm selecting sour diesel. I'm like, all right, I'm seeing this, this, this um this pattern i'm seeing this leaf color i'm seeing this kind of shape in the leaf are other people seeing that shape in the leaf that are also trying to breed sour and if that kind of validates it then it's like all right cool then that's like something i think it's more like an art form is like selecting it's like absolutely it's, it's not i mean an it intuition could be a science it's a lot of intuition I but think. i'm not a scientist i'm no. not a doctor i didn't go to college for this i'm just really passionate about it and i had an old hippie guy teach me how to talk to plants you know what i mean and, and then the language really, of the plants which is like kind of a metaphor for yeah i do talk to them but it's also a metaphor they just don't talk like, back I not out they loud do. i think but not they out do. Loud. yeah not out loud okay yeah i think if they're talking out loud feelings. there's a problem going on they're more evolved than we are man. <laughs> they have several thousand more genes than the human genome <laughs> and they've evolved way before humans have so i've you know so what about boys boys stuff. are tricks see i'm Males? i'm always I, now look yeah i i i get a little bit more uh credit for breeding i think than i I don't know. Um, I've gotten lucky. I think it was intuition, you know, being able to win a few cups with some things I created, like the strawberry cough and, and stuff. Like, and, and then carrying the strawberry cough all my life, knowing that that was something to keep around. And um, uh, But uh, I've always thought, how much weight is on the boy, the choosing of the boy? So that's almost everything to me. I mean, it depends. Like It, all, it also depends on what's going to breed true. Right? Explain, Sometimes, explain breeding true. So breeding true, right? Like... For instance, I'll use uh, cherry pie and as, an, as an example again. So if you breed cherry pie with something, it usually it tends to, to breed true, which means not, or breed true in some characteristics where the subsequent generations will show will show dominantly like that's obviously from a cherry parent. Right. Sour diesel is a little more tricky. Right. Like what breeds true in sour diesel is it's is, is its a frost profile. Right, so a lot of sour diesel crosses den- tend to dump in the bag, the same as an original sour D clone will do, and the bud structure tends to breed true in sour diesel. But one thing that does not breed true is the fucking nose, right? Because that's why I have a five-gallon bucket full of sour D crosses that are complete garbage. Right. And then two years ago, three years ago, when we really started refining, we started like, all right, this is a good sour cross. This is coming out. This is because that what makes sour diesel inherently that that unique kind of beautiful bouquet. Which, you know, that taste, it's all about the taste and the nose. Because remember when New York sour diesel buyers would come to Mendo back in the day, they wouldn't just smell the bag, they would have to taste it. And if it tasted like sour, that was it. Well, that, whatever makes sour taste or smell like that, that's a recessive gene. And that was a motherfucking bitch to do. Only a few people in the whole breeding space has been able to successfully breed really good sour, right? Like, so you have like... um, Strawberry Back in the day, there the was same, Res Dog, and then 303 with, with the G6 Jet Fuel was one of the most soury strains I ever smelled. And then you had Crockett. Even though Crockett mixed his sours with, like, sour tangy, like, he still got that sour tangy to come out sour, bro. Like, how'd you do that? Mm. You know what I mean? And so, I got high. I lost my track. 
Fair enough. No, no, no. I got you. No, I was, I, we no, were wrapping on sour. I got you. You asked me. <laughs> no, that's the the, the the strawberry is the same, and that's why I don't have a whole bunch of strawberry crosses because Bro. I've crossed it a bunch of times, and it's never better. That's strawberry cross. It's never though. better. Oh well, that was one one exception. Bro. And and that's one of the things where it becomes a different thing. Right. So when you're talking about selecting, do you want to take it in the direction of either the mom? Or the father, or are you trying to come out with something that's completely different? So, do you have you literally gotten to a point in your experience mm-hmm. that you like? If you need to add uh, aroma to something, you know what strain to cross it with. If you need to, you want to add potency, you kind of know which one to go. Is it does it break down like that, or is it is yeah, it yeah, a profile? Like, is it a whole profile? G- generally, on only on some trains, I'll I'll know. It's like if I depends if I use the male or the female on that particular cross of what's what's really going to go through like it wasn't until i had a really good sour male that like the sour nose was really coming through i was always hitting sour females with like a royal or so back to the male is it really it's all about look you're going to have trichomes early on the stock males i think the the structure are you talking your average so so if your average person with your males what i think is most important like if you're not if, if you have the ability to do predicative testing i'm okay right now Actually, yeah. If you have the ability to do predicated testing, then you could kind of like narrow down. All right, my, these males are exhibiting, you know, these these traits that will yield higher THC percentage, mm-hmm. right? But then, but if you don't have the ability for predicative testing, what I what I always suggest to people that are aspiring breeders, I was like, well, you're gonna want to grow your male out. You're gonna want to sift pollen from it, but you're gonna want to take that male all the way. What do you mean? How, so how many how many Instagram posts where you see somebody collecting pollen from a male and the male's not fully developed? Because, you know, the pods will open very early on. Right. What are you but looking the, for? But, but the male bud structure will continue to develop. And in my opinion, on really frosty vi- varieties, well, not, not my opinion. Uh, see, now to, I'm learning according something. According to my observation, right, like if past week six, seven, eight is when a male will start showing its frost profile. Uh. And that was when I figured that out. It was like it was when I started forgetting about males in the tent. And I was like, oh, shit, these <laughs> ones are getting really frosty. I'm going to use them. And then we would test them and then sell the seeds and then it would bang. That's and then that great. just became a rule. It's like, all right, past week six or seven, if you're not showing me frosty traits, that's why feminized seeds is so awesome. Right? Like I was going to ask you what taking, you thought about that. You're taking a perfect female mm-hmm. with the perfect structure, perfect fucking resin profile and you're reversing it and putting it on another perfect female. It's similar to clone only. Yeah. So it's all, it's like really similar to clone only, you know? So it's like, yeah, I, in the beginning, I was really against feminized seed because I was like so hippy dippy and Mendo and humble and just growing regular seeds. And then now you, you look can't at, breed with feminized seeds. It depends. Oh, come it on, depends. Now, tell me about this. Because sometimes, so feminized. How do we get a feminized? Right, we get we could take a healthy plant and then we reverse it, make right. it become so it can produce pollen. Right. Right. So it's a plant that's self that's pollinating another plant. Right? Okay. Well, so some no broken of, chromosomes. There's, there's there a lot nothing. of really exciting strains that have been made through. A herm accident, ah, like, like GMO geez. or sour diesel. What a great you know, insight. Story of sour diesel. What a great so insight. a lot of people say, "Hey, you can't breed with fem fem seeds." Like, it's possible, but is there a risk? Hell yeah. Because mm. this did the, the, the sour D's hermy really easy. Hell yeah. That's mm-hmm. why we waited five years to release our sour. Actually, it wasn't getting good until like year three. And then we was like, "All right, needs another two years testing. Let's see if we could back cross it again on this original diesel and make it come out proper." But when it comes to males, bro, um, testing it all the way to the end, you're able to really see if it's got a frost, a frost expression. You're able to gauge like your leaf to bud ratio because a lot of those characteristics are going to really shine through. In all my years, I have never brought a male to fruition. Yeah, you got to take it all the way to the end. I've never. It's all so. All the way. So, so that's why I know that intuition or luck. I mean, luck plays a part in life, right? And we can't define it. You know, they say luck can be defined. You know, people that look for things, find things, you know. You know, you're not going to see that $20 bill on the ground if you're not looking for it. So you make your own luck to a certain degree. But, you know, I just felt like I've always gotten pretty lucky to have a very small sampling, be lucky enough to choose a good male, to bring something out, whether it was my chem you're dog choice, from good whether it was too. my start. Yeah. Well, right? Yeah, yeah. But you still have to choose the good male or you're not yeah. going forward or you're just stumped right in the road. So... So that the, everybody's learning a little bit stuff today. Shout out to you for those those star dog seeds you got back in the day. <laughs> because I wouldn't have a career right now if it fucking wasn't for you. So like we were talking about. Did you pick what, those up somewhere? Really, in, 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 in reality, you were completely correct that what ultimately brought us together 
was Frenchie. Yep. But you've been an influence on me since day one, like when I was in Mendo. Because I want all my cups doing some form of veganics that you pioneered with Shiloh. Mm. And that you became like the fucking man for. You know, you, you, you invented that shit. I you forefathered know, so like, it. Yeah, you, know, you, I brought for, it to the yeah forefront, you forefathered you know? it, and, and Shiloh was a big fucking, um, he was a big influence on me, but you has set such an impact. I wouldn't have won all my cups if it wasn't for you. My first chem dog strain, the reason why I brought that up, is because he used to work with a guy that we both know in Willits, and he's pretty gangster, so we'll keep his name quiet right here. <laughs> and, um, and you know who I'm talking about, because we talked about him a lot last week. Okay. And you gave him the star dog beans, too. Yeah. And he, how I met him is he was the best chem dog and sour grower in all of Mendo. And I made so much money off of buying his packs. <laughs> and I, at the bottom of some of the chem dog packs, because sometimes I'd buy a pound for myself. It was, uh-huh. it was fire, which is like sacrilege if you're a grower. I was like, no, this dude's work is the best. I never have problem moving. You know, some and of I that, found star dog seeds in the bottom of this fucking pound, bro. Some of that. So, so the, the Cherry Lopez that I was talking to you about had sisters. There was the Cherry Lopez, the Sour Lopez, and the Candy Lopez. And the Candy Lopez was a phenotype that was really close to the Sour D. And so there was definitely sours in there as well. Yeah. And uh, He was the man of growing that shit. Yeah. But it yeah. was because of you, you, you worked with him. And I was able to get them seeds out of the bottom of that pound. I just got lucky to meet really, you know, just just passionate people that, you know, they were, we were all, it was a, bro, it, it, look, I'm not saying there wasn't fighting and there wasn't assholes and there wasn't people who got shot and killed, but for the most part, it was really a brotherhood. It was it really a brotherhood. Was. Until you had a really reason was. to hate somebody, yeah, it, it really might have been was. a stupid reason, but until you had a reason, it was like if you knew that we were all doing the same thing, we're all the same, we were all a brotherhood. Dude, that was the best you, thing about Mendo. You would, where, where did you, you get your you, water you could tank? Have where did you get your water yeah, tank? You could have, where did you get your soil? You could have the biggest right. beef with somebody back in the day in Mendo or Humboldt, and you'd see him at the store, and y'all motherfuckers are still not at each other. Right. Because you're still in the game together. Right. You're still doing the same thing. Right. There was always like, no matter amount of hate, there was always that mutual respect. So, so that brotherhood thing, it's like, yeah, that's what man. I miss the most right now, you know? It's a, that's a dying breed, that old brotherhood. Well, because it's just the world, the whole world's different. Everything changes. It's all different. And, 100%. you know, like you know I don't live in Mendo anymore. You don't live in Mendo anymore. Um, Shala still lives in Mendo. Yeah, 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 he's still up there. I know, still, there's still some people up there. Yeah, my sister's still up there. I want to say just back and forth. I just I don't live there full time. I want to say Shiloh, if you get to see this, I love you, brother. Uh, I I miss those times that we had up in Brook Trails and uh, the early days of trying to make a movie about veganics, and that was. I spent thirty grand of my own money, flew us to I- Ithaca. We had a, a crew called the the Ganja Geeks. And it was a production crew. No way. We were making a movie with spoofs like Bong with the Wind instead of <laughs> Gone with the Wind. And he played Rhett Butler and I was uh, the other guy and, and uh, uh, Scarlett O'Hara was the Bong. And we actually did all these skits in front of a green screen and everything. And, and the movie never got made, but we had fun doing it. You know, there was, there was some crazy times. And there's still clips of it. There's a clip of it online that's got like three or four million views or something. No way. Yeah. It's, wow. like, it's like 13 years old. And, uh, yeah, you came out with those videos like around 09, 2010, around. No, it was earlier than that. Or was it, it was earlier than that. It was, uh, so I remember back in 2010. Oh, no, you're right. Scouring it, you're YouTube right. It was 09, 2010. Exactly. Videos to see exactly what nutrient bottles you were using. Exactly. <laughs> and in 2010 is when the mortgage mic crisis happened. I lost my house up in Brook Trails and I moved down to Smele, where I am now. And, uh, so. I'm having fun with this. Uh, we could just go on talking forever. I'm going to see if I have any uh, any insightful questions left on my list here. Oh, yeah, here's a good one. What's your favorite country of origin for cannabis strains and why? Thailand. Oh, good one. Thailand are, are, are one of, you know, the sub-Saharan African countries. More, more like Malawi. Um, have you I like the sativas. Like I, I mean, my my strength in breeding and growing is with like hybrids and indicas, but my favorite thing to smoke is like sativas. So like my Me favorite too. strain of all time was the old pineapple Thai um, clone. Do you remember Blue Hawaiian? Yeah, bro. Yeah, that, that was, was insane. Yeah, that was my favorite. Yeah, 
for years that was before insane. I found strawberry cough and then smoked that for the last 25, 30 years. It was that blue Hawaiian I used to buy from a cop and stop in Brooklyn through a bedding window cage, you know, when I was 16 years old. You know, dime bags through the through the uh, OTB bedding window. Damn, I haven't seen blue Hawaiian in a long time. Yeah. 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 So have you worked with any of those strains? I mean, it's, you know, let me just put it this way. It's like no one likes pulling tarp on a 16-weeker. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, so, I, you know, I've limited how much I could work. You know, like we, we're doing projects in Colombia where, you know, we're more towards the equator. So, you know, now we have we have a more conducive opportunity, you know, not a more conducive opportunity. We just have, you know, a better opportunity to be able to to experience to experiment with sativas because it's going to be more in its, you know, in, in its geographical location. Granted, you know, Colum a lot of these sativas aren't going to be from Colombia, but, you know, when you're more towards the equator and you have that regular, like, kind of 12, 12 hour timing on the daylights, where you kind of like, keep a strain out there for like, you know, 16 to 20 weeks, then you could really, you know, start playing with I never that. had that <clears throat> patience. So that brings me to, uh, so you told me about you got some stuff popping off in Colombia. Yep. And um, has something to do with, does it have, uh, did I hear you right? Does it have something to do with pharma? Uh, kind of, yeah, because it, it's going to be, it's a GACP, you know, permitted facility. Uh -huh. And the guy that we're working with was one of the first, you know, GMP certified farmers down in Colombia. And GMP and GACP, for people who don't know, that's the international protocol and guidelines for governing the production of pharmaceutical goods so or in this or in this case it's like if you're Bayer and you're selling and, and you're manufacturing an opiate product right you own Bayer owns tons of poppy fields in Spain mm -hmm. and so and then but and they grow those poppies and they process those poppies well the the set of guidelines and protocols that that governs the regulation and and the permits for being able to grow pharmaceutical products is called GMP and GACP, good management practices and good agricultural practices. So what's your what's your primary goal so, for being in Colombia? Uh, to be able to produce bulk seed, play around with sativas, but for us it it was it because nobody's pulling tarp out there. Yeah, no one's really pulling tarp out there. It's all right. twelve twelve. You veg everything under lights and you just throw it out. <laughs> so it allows us to kind of sift through larger populations and not incur some of the insane costs that we now have in legal cannabis across, you know, the, you know, across the United States. It's like running, a, it's in California, it's, this is the most expensive state, more than Hawaii. Hawaii is number two, California is number one, the most expensive state to fucking run a business. Yeah. And, and this is not even talking a cannabis business where right. you have like 280E. Oh, oh cannabis is 10 times worse. Taxes. Yeah, it's you're four getting, or five times worse. Four or five times right. worse. So For real. we just made the logical next step of going to a country that, you know, people were already growing our seeds. They wanted to grow more. And so, you know, we're just down there producing bulk genetics for, you know, and, you know, really sifting, you know, to see what we could find in our populations. So it's, are you all, so you're, um, you, you obviously, you're doing, um, you know, breeding and seeding and stuff like that. Are, is it also a good chance to just take advantage of learning those protocols? Is it a good place to, to Yeah, we've been working on protocols, them through, you know, you know <laughs> shout out, like, my brother and my partner, dude. I, I'm not, wouldn't it be fuck all without him? It was Professor Q, it was Quentin from, you know, and he was the, so I'm not the founder of French Connection, I'm the co-founder. You know, he, he came to California you know, by almost seven, eight years ago He'll and, forgive and, me. and helped me at a time where I was going through a really hard time with my company. And it was one of the first times where um, I was losing stuff. The company was hurting because I was making bad decisions and, you know, um, I wasn't really in the right headspace, but can't he, all be up. It's, there's yeah, gotta oh, be some, it's always there, an right? up and down, yeah. you know, and it's like, I own my fuck ups and I fucked but up, but you had a brother to you know, help a few you through times. But when I met him in Spain through Frenchie, um, he had the cleanest grows I've ever seen. You can eat off the floor in his grows. Dude, Don't you always respect that? And he said, I'll Fuck. give up all these grows to go work with you in Cali for a year. And like, I identify with that because I gave up everything to go to Mendo, right? I fucking just, I left, like the family was down here in San Diego and like I bounced and just made the leap. I, I, I didn't have much money. I didn't have a fucking plan. I knew I'm just going to run into OG Mike and, and beg him for a place on the farm, <laughs> you know? And so when Quentin was willing to do that, it's like, dude, that like really touched my heart. But he's the one <coughs> that we built. I said, you help me save my company. You help me out. I'm going to help build a company around you. I'm going to like right my wrongs from old partners I had. And I'm going to actually like honor you the way you, you, you need to be honored as an artist. And then he just ended up being like a fucking brother, dude. 
like just family dude one of the best people i ever met and like you know i wouldn't met him without frenchy you know what i mean and so because of him the last two years because we expanded to europe and created fishnell french connection we were getting hired by all these different companies right when it was starting to go legal because they wanted to build big facilities and help help us you know build their business plans and their operating plans and write their sops and we would it, we'd tell them how okay this is how much it's going to cost you to build a facility and they go well we want to be gmp certified and we go like all right we'll give us a few months and we'll give you you know a new model and that, that you could look at and the models became so large and the investment for these projects became so big that these companies just was like hey do you just want to work with us because we can't afford to just you know hire you as a consultant and That's it makes sense shit. if we just give you a piece of that and that, none of that would be possible without quentin because he speaks english french and spanish so we were in spain for, we were in barcelona for like the first six years of the company's life then we went to build a facility, learn the GMP protocols in, in, in Puerto Rico. I mean, uh, I mean, in Portugal, mm -hmm. in Portugal. And then now we're in France, um, helping build one of the country's first grows there. So um, shout out to Quentin and GMP. I feel that, man. I, he I, makes all that possible. And I wouldn't have met him without Frenchie. He's like my brother. He saved, you know, it's like, that's family forever. My mom calls her him her third son. So I can't wait to meet you, Quentin. Yeah. You'll forgive me 100%. for Shout uh, out not uh, Q. crediting you with being a co-founder. I mean, he went to college for this. Like his 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 master says the amelioration of grind. You know, the amelioration of seeds, and he, he learned how to tissue culture. Um, he learned how in vitro wow. tissue culturing method from the guy who invented the method for tissue culturing orchids. Wow. Because he had difficulty tissue culturing orchids for years because. This guy discovered that you needed this symbiotic fungus to be able to get this thing to reproduce in the agar or, or, or to culture in the agar. And he learned from that guy. So like, and he's just a real plant guy, man. Like I've, I've learned a lot from him and you know, it's, it's really, it's like this really symbiotic relationship. He's got more of the scientific mind and you know, now he grows more of like a Mendo and Humboldt style the way, you know, kind of like I showed him, but mixed with like kind of his methods, you know, like, like a real artist. Should so shout out can, Professor Q. I can tell that's special. I can feel it, man. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is really awesome. We 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 got we we talked so much about the culture and so much about all the people that influenced us and everything, and that's all really cool. I really think the people listening will enjoy that. And then we only talked a little bit about uh, you know selecting males and selecting females and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know. Just take a minute or two before we end everything and tell people a little bit about your process about you know i don't know how you decide how you decide what to work on next because there's a million things a million ways to go yeah. how do you decide where to go what to breed and and how long does it take you know just encapsulate it depends if like if i'm on like a sick one after a certain strain like sour years and that's just like a year's project yeah. right? right and but it, how i decide you know, I'll be honest, man. Like a lot of it, you know, we incorporate some hype stuff into what we do. What do you but mean? What is it? For, for the first like gelatos folks. and shit like oh, okay, that. Right, and, right. You know, because we have a lot of, you know, clients that in Europe and, you know, we have a global client base, right? So mm -hmm. for what, what to what's old sure. for, for growers here in the States is sure. like still super novel um, and, and amazing and different gotcha. to somebody in, some, in a country like Chile or, right. or Thailand. So but when i go around selecting it, it really depends like what you like to cook you know like that's for me it's like it's like music it's right like you ask an artist like you know what where do you, what inspires you to to um to, to write a song like they'll hear a sound and so or they'll, or, they'll, or, they'll, or they'll hear a harmony or a beat and then but but for me it's like i'll smell something on a plant and i'm like and then i have ideas where where i could take that smell Right. Okay, so you got so you got a male and you got a female and you've decided you're going to make a cross. How does that happen? So you take your male, like w w for me, it's like really simple. And how we used to like, if we don't have a purpose built male room, uh -huh. like how we collect pollen is super fucking primitive. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's you know? almost embarrassingly primitive, but this is how I've been doing it for like, you know, 15 years now, and um, we grow the male out mm -hmm. when it's full tall. So a lot of people choose shorter males well i'm used to growing outdoors so i don't select my males until they're like eye high right so my males are already big by the time they're flowering into my tent right and i kind of want that because i i choose taller grow tents or when we had purpose-built rooms mm -hmm. we have purpose-built rooms in mm -hmm. europe for this but we have like have a tall ceiling and then i like to plant tall because then i could bend it over i could really clean it up 
and bend it over so all the fucking flower mass is kind of horizontal. And the reason why I do that is because as it's flowering, I set a table under that and then a big, a big, it used to be this huge mirror. And now I just get whatever, like coffee table glass. Like I'll go to like a thrift store and be like, how much for that glass coffee table? And I'll take the glass off of that and put that, you know, on top of the thing. And uh-huh. I'll let the, the mail just kind of dump on there. When it fully opens, then um, I'll collect on the, on the mirror. And then I try to trim my, my mail buds to a point where they kind of fit in a Pyrex dish over a Pyrex dish. Mm. So then I'll hold a Pyrex dish with like, because I like how it has these walls on the side. Mm-hmm. Pollen's going to plume either way. Mm-hmm. But when it's on the mirror, it just kind of plumed laterally. But when, when you have the Pyrex, you kind of control it a little more. Like, you're in the tent, right? Mm-hmm. And then, so, I, I collect pollen in the tent with the fan off in a Pyrex. I make sure I cover that. And they go, well, how do you get out of the tent? And you have pollen all over you. And you're about to probably walk into your house, track pollen, or go see your females outside, right? And so, I learned this from Subcool. <laughs> right? And um, Subcool used to exit his mailroom uh, spraying water. Oh. He would take a sprayer and walk out and have water spraying over and then he would spray himself down inside the room because water um, kills, it kind of, you know, de- Sub destroys cool the, brother. the cell How did that go an episode without your, we didn't go an episode yeah. without your name coming up. No, didn't never, happen. Never. Yeah, bro. Like, shout out, so cool. I fucking miss him. That was a hard one. But yeah, I, I um, uh, Pyrex, spray yourself down, spray the tent down to kill any excess pollen to, if you want to control it. Oh, and most importantly, the tent and or the room is going to be on negative pressure. So I put passive intake, no forced intake, but it's on a couple of HEPAs to control just in case there is something where there is positive pressure, like a malfunction, then it would be contained in the HEPA filters, right? Um, rooms are super sealed, the doors are sealed, <coughs> but you want negative pressure on that room. Would you go to all this precaution if, like me, you were only using one pollen? I mean, it, it depends with the proximity I am of of my garden, you know, cause I've always in Mendo and humble, I've always collected my pollen in like a house or a facility that was right next to the grow mm-hmm. next to like, you know, a thousand pound harvest. And, you know, especially if you're partnered sure. with people, sure. I'm in humble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like one of the scariest times I had making <laughs> seeds in Humboldt was in Petrolia, which is like one of the most exclusive areas, dangerous places in fucking Humboldt. And I remember partnering up with my buddy, Josh, Josh free, Shout out, Josh. I love you. I'm a better person today because of you. He was one of the biggest growers in the history of Humble. He's no joke. One of the most respected guys. And I partnered up with him one year because of Frenchie. Frenchie linked us up together. And he said, hey, let's make some seeds. And he had this whole fucking field. Like, uh, it was a, like two acres of weed. I on the side of uh, Matol Road. And then our seeded, our, our seed production plants, there was like, in like 200 gallon pots. There were like hundreds or 200 gallon pots. There was like six of these motherfuckers so we had six big monsters and i had to seed all of it and they were taller than the two acres across what do you mean you had to seed all of it yeah because that was the plan we were going to make seeds just on these six plants and i was like bro they're right next to your field and he was like you think you could do it i was like yeah i could fucking do it you know yeah. like because there's certain times you want to pollinate outdoors yeah. you know yeah. be a little and little i overspray. only did it when the wind was okay. right i'd be in the store right. right they'd be like some dude i don't know some old, some mountain dude be like I heard you're working with josh yeah He's like, you're going to keep that pollen to yourself? <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, man, I'm having this fucking conversation right now. I was like, yeah, was, you know, I don't try to be disrespectful. Yes, sir, I'm, I'm de- definitely not. And so that was like the most scared I have ever was producing seed, but like didn't see nothing, none, none of it. Like, you know, Josh, we're going to do another project this year um, where um, he's got a bunch of property that, you know, he wants to make, you know, wants to make seed out of. But that was like, when you risk getting pollen on someone else's shit, you know, but, but the, the whole thing was I'd sprayed that side of the crop down with water and I had a water barrier. Right. I sprayed if I didn't, you know, it's all about con- controlling. You can the deactivate drift. a grain of pollen can, Get that can, shit wet. can carry across an ocean yeah. and be viable somehow, you know, but if you spray a grain of pollen with water, it is instantly deactivated. Yeah. Instantly. Yeah. So, and so, so you pollinate, you do a little bit of pollination, and if, you, and if you're at all worried about any left, so this is the way, to simplify like even more, what I, what I did was, I used to go into the bathroom, 
in my grow room and I have an apartment somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, and I would take the one idea, that I wanted to pollinate. I would bring it out into the bathroom, oh, dude, right? And, and you'd have the exhaust. But the point was is that you were very careful. You only used a tiny little bit. You did the paintbrush thing, right? Make sure no pollens on your clothes. And, and, and well, you left... And then you took it all off, or you naked, maybe nudity was involved. I can't say it wasn't. But the point, what I point out is that plant would stay in there for 24 hours so that you'd allow the pollination the op yeah. to take place. And then you'd spray it with water, and that's when you'd put it back in the room. Yeah, then right? you're good. Right. Then you're good to go. So, so, so. Oh, and Tyvek paint suits. If you're right. collecting pollen in the tent, wear right. a fucking Tyvek suit. So I got a quote from Subcool. Subcool said, uh, it's time to pollinate when your plants look horny. So cool said that. <laughs> I love so. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking so. So, so like, is there an optimal time? I waited. I pollinated uh, right at the beginning of the fourth week. This, oh, is, this is indoor. Indoor is a different animal than outdoor. No, you're good. You I know? mean, because we still do weeks in greenhouse. We right. We do most of a bulk of our production in green. About half of it in greenhouse. Around f like between four and six, you generally need six weeks for the seeds to develop uh-huh you know some strains you get away with five okay but you know i'll hit them multiple times and if i'm seeding a plant i'm letting it go uh, it's gonna stay so i should it's, have done it two weeks yeah. earlier no you were good i'm okay oh, oh i know i'm okay yeah, that's perfect okay sometimes i wait till it's like almost too frosty because i hand pollinate uh-huh i either hand pollinate or or or, or use a powder sprayer you could use a power sprayer. Got um, myself a nice little paintbrush. I cut it half down, so it only had about ten fucking uh, strains on it. And I went in there with a little fucking, um, you know, those little uh, jeweler's plastic cups. Yeah. I had, I put a little bit in there the day before, washed, and and I went in there, and I'm only using one pollen. So I just went around to each plant. I opened it for a second. I put a little bit. I was no air moving, no breathing, no nothing. <laughs> I touched, <laughs> I did a little this, I did, of course there was a few, a few grains moving around, but I didn't have to worry about it because it's only one type of pollen. The overspray, I didn't have to worry about it. It's in my own room, I'm not pollinating my neighbor's garden, I'm not pollinating a cash crop, anything like that. So it was pretty, pretty simple. And I went around each one, I put a twist tie around each branch that I wanted, so I'd make sure I capture that branch and, oh, that's and, then, that's awesome. and, then, and those crosses are all gonna... Did you seed all the plants or did you, do, you save some flower to... Oh no, I just did one bud on every Every no pheno. Okay. Yes. So I've got doggone sour four five seven, and I've got F Frank Murphy one three five Did you seven. That starberry, though? I got the starberry, okay. the strawberry, the cherry, yes, uh, the grape, the doggone, the strelka, all of them. I did a little bit on all of them. Oh, sick. Okay. So. So we got some work to do. Oh, and the Chernobyl. Oh, yeah, Chernobyl. That'll the go Chernobyl. hit with the Larry OG, huh? Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's not that's that's a good idea right there. That's that's some pretty. When's shit. this episode come out? Uh, Tuesday, buddy. Yesterday. Oh no way. Yesterday. Uh... Well, Leo, I think that we've meandered through the uh, the Mendocino forest, and you know, I know that we could go on for another hour and a half. But um, I don't. I don't have enough money to pay the crew, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got paid for this? Yeah. Oh, sh shit, I forgot. I'm gonna need dinner. Now you really know we're in the weed industry. But absolutely, we, we will <laughs> do it again. Paid? We will do it again. We'll. Uh, no, I would love to. We'll Thank we'll you. get into it and uh, we'll give people an update on some of the uh, the actual crosses that we're working on and and. Um, and so I just want to thank you for being here and making the drive out to our no, beautiful location. And, um, and brother, just keep the faith. Yeah, thank you. And keep doing the good work. Okay, and you. we're going to keep doing growing at home. Grow weed at home. Gua. Gua. With Kyle Gua. Gua. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We will have you back because there's, there's a lot to talk about. And it would be really cool if all of you went to homegrowncannabiscode.com slash podcast and uh, you can leave some questions for Leo, for me. Uh, what did we leave out that, you know, we should have mentioned that we didn't and we'll make sure we get you an answer and we'll see you hopefully on the next episode of Grow Weed at Home with Kyle Kushman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us till the end of another enlightening episode of Grow Weed at Home with me, your host, Kyle Cushman. What an amazing trip it's been exploring the deep waters of cannabis breeding with our esteemed guest, Leo Stone. 
I hope our venture into this untouched territory of home growing has ignited a newfound interest and respect for the science, art, and passion that goes into creating the unique cannabis strains we all savor. It's been an eye-opening experience, hasn't it? From understanding the basics of cannabis genetics, touching upon advanced breeding techniques, to unveiling the realities and challenges faced during the creation of exotic, award-winning cannabis strains. We've managed to squeeze a lot into this episode, ladies and gentlemen. We truly hope it's been as intriguing for you as it has been for us. I'd like to thank Leo Stone of Aficionado French Connection once again for coming on our podcast and sharing his wealth of knowledge and experience with us. His insights were not only educational, but inspiring as well. Before we wrap up, let me reiterate how grateful I am to all of you for being such loyal listeners. Your enthusiasm and support are what keep this podcast going. Keep sharing the knowledge, keep sparking those conversations. Together, we're building a community that cultivates not just cannabis, but curiosity and learning as well. Remember, there's always more to explore, always more to learn. So join us again next week for another incredible journey into the world of at-home cannabis growing. Whether you're a casual listener or a serious connoisseur, I promise there's always something in store for you at Grow Eat at Home with Kyle Cushman. This is your host, Kyle Cushman, signing off from Episode 7. Keep growing, keep sowing, and most importantly, keep glowing. Good night, folks, and stay tuned for more.